focus on fire management. To help you learn more about the subject, the college and I arranged for you to all go in on a tour to parts of the Menominee Forest. We were lucky enough to have two speakers guide you and provide some examples, and to help you gain some more insight into how fire was used as a land management tool. To go over fire management usage and its effects, we'll have Jeff Freno, uh, who will take you to a white pine stand. While you're there, you will, he will talk about how and why the Menominee used fire as a land management tool. We also have Rich Anamita, uh, who will take you to look at an oak savanna and its surrounding habitat. He will also go over some of the positive effects of prescribed burning as well. Any questions? If there are no questions, I'm going to have you split into two groups. Just as a reminder before the tour begins, please remember to pay attention to the speaker. But feel free to look around as you go so you get the full experience. Without further ado, let's the tour begin. And remember to apply lots of books. All right, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what we see over here? Okay. Um, we're standing just off of an uh, ancient trail system that runs through the reservation from basically northwest through the reservation. Um, it's reliably dated according to archaeological evidence that I've, I've come across along the trail to be at least 10,000 years old. Because it's so old, uh, there's also an interesting aspect of the trail is that you can match up different stand types along the trail and see where these fire dependent species of trees and com plant communities were initiated off the trail, most likely through prescribed burning by Menominees through the years. Um, some of these stands are, like we see here, this stand is originally, uh, some of the oldest trees are close to three to 400 years old in this stand. Mm. You see a lot of younger gen uh, regeneration here, younger by at least 200 years behind me, you know, 200 year, year old tree, 180 to 200 year old tree, so. But you see, a, um, these interesting formations of how these stands originated off the trail system with the use of fire. So the cultural stories talk about an active fire regime with the Menominees, you know, depending on the area, how you wanted to um, coax or manipulate certain types of plants to grow um, for medicinal purposes or for food or for hunting areas where you have a clear, cleared out area underneath the trees. Using, with the use of fire, we are managing this forest and this, this whole northeastern Wisconsin for thousands of years, no doubt. So, so in terms of like, um, like berry production and region, mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that the Menominee back then were aware of the um, positive effects of prescribed burning? Well, most definitely. Um, with that active management of the land, um, it, it was dependent on their survival. They had to learn to coexist sustainably within the forest. You, the use of fire is a natural um, event in the forest. Um, this forest, or these white pine you see behind me and around us here, this is uh, an odd type of stand. This white pine is sitting in a, in a sea of hardwoods wrapped all around. It's an odd because, um, because of um, all the sugar maple and hardwoods that surround it. In order to keep diversity and maintain diversity, the use of fire has to be applied to the forest. Menominee's learned that long ago. You know, multiple low intensity fires can keep a stand diversified and healthy um, and and prevent some of the things you see out west with the catastrophic fires because 
they haven't been able to keep an active burn regime also. So you see cra catastrophic fires threatening people, resources, burning trees, you know, killing the soil. Yeah. It's that multiple low intensity fires that, um, that so much benefit the land. Okay. Uh, well, what else do we got here? Okay. Mm -hmm. As far as this stand, now it originated with fire, and we haven't been able to apply fire here for some 300 years, probably three to 400 years. So the stand is slowly transitioning. Um, we start seeing less and less white pine behind us, and more and more of the sugar maple and the beech here. These are more fire intolerant species um, as the canopy the, the tops of the trees open up as white pines die slowly one by one the canopy opens up allowing these species in to these canopies and it will slowly transition because of the leaf cover of these these um, intolerant species of trees because of the leaf cover the white pine seed can't can't get down to the ground and get enough sunlight to germinate mm -hmm. so you got a slow transition it's a successional stage in the stand of trees you know, the only way to keep white pine or to grow white pine um, in a healthy sustainable way is the use of fire I've spent almost 30 years working at the forestry here trying to mimic the effects of fire um, at great cost I mean, I'm talking millions of dollars over the years trying to s uh, prepare an area for planting or seed fall of white pine using other means we use chemical herbicides we use mechanical rakes dragging chains across the ground, roller chopping through the brush. Um, but like I said, it's, it's really uh, cost-intensive projects. Whereas if we just lit a fire with a prescribed burn, you know, we'll do the effects probably two, you know, a couple of times better than what the effects we were able to manage using all these different types of tools. It's a lot easier. Yeah, easier. exactly, exactly. Right. But it's it's overcoming that stigma of fire, yeah. you know, that's been built up for, you know, at least a hundred years yeah. or more. That stigma of using fire, when our program lights a prescribed burn, you know, you, you feel the tension in the back of the minds of all the firefighters. Mm -hmm. You can't let that fire get away, get out of containment, and even cause a huge public relations incident. So right. and we're still fighting that as a tribe. So, How do you believe um, the community around here perceives prescribed burning? Generally, it is, it's favorable. It's favorable because because it's in our tradition from long ago, the active use of fire. So it's generally positive. Um, they would like to see more fire on the land. In fact, um, I no longer fight fire or in the fire program, so, but I do prescribe burnings on the side for the community. A lot of gardens, a lot of lawns, you know, mm. you know people, people actively want to use fire on the land, even if they don't have the experience to do it, they'll mm -hmm. call me or somebody else to, to, to um, execute the burn. A lot of gardens. It's, it's kind of coming back into fashion, which is good. Mm -hmm. People burning gardens. That was, that was one of our fire activities long ago, is Menominee's. You know, prescribed fires in our garden areas. You know, we had 
huge garden complexes, um, these summer settlement areas. I mean, they stretch for, you know, a mile in length of different garden beds laid out. But that was actively burned, you know, yearly. Whenever, before we went into the area to plant, it was burnt. Mm. It cut down on the insects, um, the weeds, you know. Everybody uses herbicides now, but, but back then it was fire that, that kept the weeds down long enough for the food food uh, plants to grow. So now we definitely understood all yeah. of that. Back yes, then. definitely. Insects, same thing, burning the garden areas. So there's multiple, multiple benefits of using fire if it's done in, a, in, the, in the right way, I should say. So uh, what are we looking at here, Jeff? Um, this is an older stand of white pine, most likely uh, as a result of um, prescribed fire lit off the trail we were on earlier. This is much older pine, probably uh, at least 400, 400 and older. Mm. You can you can witness around us um, the pine is really starting to fade out. We're starting to get a lot of hardwoods like sugar maple, red maple, some beech in here, and a lot of hemlock coming in because we're close to a um, wetland edge here. Mm, okay. That's why um, these pine are subsisting longer along the edge of the swamp or this wetland area because there's more access to water and that sort of thing. So these generally are the oldest pine a lot of times on the edges of the wetland areas because it's a wetland area transition area from wet wet to the hill behind us mm -hmm. you know we're getting a lot of hemlock coming in this gap here hemlock's a good species long-lived species ancient species uh, but it's not white pine you know we got a lot of hemlock you know it's maintaining the white pine you need fire and like I said, this is uh, an older stand than the one we were were uh, just a um, just a little while ago here on our walk. So. so I don't know if there's a difference between this stand and other stands, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of I guess future goals, what would be the future goal of a stand like this? Mm -hmm. um, if you're managing for the trees, um, future goal would be probably to highlight hemlock in this area because it's a good transition area going from the wet to the dry in the hill. Uh, you could also use fire. Fire has been used. A lot of our hemlock stands most likely originated from fire, from the Nominee's use of fire. Because we didn't not only burn on the higher ground, but we burned in the wetlands also. You know, we have a lot of medicinal plants that we use, um, like cattails, you know, willows, that sort of thing, in the lower areas that were actively burned, not just sites along trail systems. So it's an active management in the wetlands and the upper hills, the oak hills. We passed um, some oak on the way in here, driving in to this. Maybe we can stop, maybe uh, take a picture of the oak Definitely. to add. Yeah. Because um, a lot of our oak stands are res a result of fire. The trail system also goes through a lot of oak stands. One of the benefits under oak is uh, regeneration of oak, but also keeping the leaf litter off the top so you can harvest acorns in the fall. Mm. So that was uh, a food use, use used as food and medicine, the red oak. Red oak and the uh, hills oak, or um, scrub oak, they call it. Well, let's take a look at that oak stand then. Okay. Let's go. Right. So what do we got going on here? We're in a section um, south along the trail. Um, like I talked earlier about Menominee's using fire not only for white pine, also for red oak on um, oak hills. Um, clearing the leaf litter away so it's easier harvesting acorns. Um, getting certain medicinal plants that that are associated with the northern red oak. Um, get those propagated on their own using fire. 
So, in um, in modern day, we also use fire in oak areas. Um, my time as forest development, I had a problem with um, when we were trying to plant northern red oak in uh, basically plantations. We plant the trees, do everything that we were supposed to do according to what the latest research was and we get the tree to grow maybe a foot off the ground and then it would stay that way it would maintain it would still it was still a healthy tree but it wouldn't get any growth after that um, one of the things that i theorized through experience is that there was lack of fire in that plantation that red oak plantation so i talked to the fire program and seen that it was done one or two other places in the country so I basically gave them permission to all the red oak plantation stands that we had to go ahead and schedule them to run fire through. The fire program ran fire through uh, I think four to five stands in the first year and uh, they run the fire through did what fire does, it knocked, it, it burnt the, the red oak um, trees that we had planted in there. But what happened the year after is they, they had a huge phenomenal growth. Even though it, after the fire they were gone, the stems were gone, the fire basically burnt the stems. Um, what it did is spurred growth in the root system of the established northern red oak, the planted red oak. I had two to three times the growth the year after the fire mm. than what I had originally to begin with. You know, remember I talked about it only growing to maybe a foot in size and maintaining that constant, no growth, but um, a healthy tree. Once we run fire through those stands, we had two to three times the growth. And those just burned the, the branches? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it burned the stem also. Oh. So it didn't look like there was red oak in the, st in the plantation mm -hmm. anymore once the fire went through, but mm -hmm. the re-sprout from the roots, the established roots, oh, okay. um, jump-started them. Now they're they're growing. Uh, the original stands are probably about six to seven feet high. Mm. So okay. oh. after seeing that, you know, I gave the fire program the okay run it through my bosses, gave the fire program, whatever uh, red oak stands you can uh, schedule, plantations, go ahead and burn. That's using the ecological knowledge of the, the, my Menominee elders, applying it to a, a more scientific uh, setting at the forestry. So, so looking at how um, the Menominee used to burn back then mm -hmm. and how it's done now, is there any changes within with future methods? No. I was trying trying to steer the program towards more more of a traditional ways of burning. So we've made some inroads, we've some accomplishments, um, but it's a work in progress right now. I think there's a lot of knowledge our elders possessed because they were out here in the forest for 24 hours a day seven days a week all year long you don't help but you can't help but learn the longer you're in the forest um, even though I've been at the forestry for 28 to you know 28 years I'm still learning when I go into the forest um, the longer you're around something the more you learn about it and I think the program is on the right track now. The confidence level is getting there. Um, you get a few burns, prescribed burns under your belt, and you know what I mean? Yeah. Then you want to try new things. So. Picks up momentum. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Everyone exactly. gets on board. And projects like this, being able to speak about fire, helps that process. You know? Yeah, public outreach. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, thank you for speaking with us. That was, thank you. was really helpful. We learned a lot. So. Thank you.
So Rich, tell us a little bit about where we're at right now. Okay, this, this particular stand here is considered an um, oak savanna. And the oak savanna is an um, important component of the forest because it, it also produces blueberry patches. Um, as you can see, well, you can't see it from here, but over here and historically there's an old plow line farrow from the preventing uh, forest fires. Historically, the, the before Smoky Bear time, the um, people still were thought of as fire, wildfire suppression as being important. Now these stumps right here, these three stumps, this is an older, way before my time, I cannot remember when these, the fire went through, it was a wildfire. Okay, so, so, so the fires back then were important to the forest because it, it helped the, um, the gathering of the Menominee people for food for the winter time. And like I said before, the blueberries, okay, when a fire would go through, it would change the, the, the plants and the trees within the stand and some of the trees will survive. But it was, fire was important for, for helping to maintain blueberry patches. So if a wildfire went through from lightning strike or, or something, um, a particular stand would be in limbo until the blueberry patches started to grow. But another stand would have blueberry patches that would have blueberries for that summer so the people would camp close to those areas to collect blueberries until the stand where the fire went through years later would start producing blueberries blueberries no no excuse me fire helped bring nutrients to the soil so the blueberries would be vibrant and and, and large so the people would move to the older, the, the new stands that the fire went through to pick blueberries and it was always like this, the gathering of, of food for the winter time and, and people never stayed in one area at one time. It was always different year after year after year after year. It was sustainable though. So it was it's sustainable, yeah. yes, it's sustainable and it continues but but today, because of the fire suppression, the, the, the stands are changing, new species are, are, species of trees are taking over the stands, which was not there 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. So today, this particular stand here was, was mostly oak. And blueberries, lots of blueberries, carpet of blueberries. Now we see this particular here, soft maple, is starting to grow in this stand. And long, 30 years ago, soft maple never was here, but now it's starting to arrive. So one or two generations from now, this stand will be completely different. Uh, soft maple may take over this oak stand. Uh, hope it doesn't because we'll lose that cultural aspect of this area. Yeah. Okay, so what do we got going in front of us here? Oh, okay, we well, we got a, a patch of blueberries here. As we're walking through the forest here, we walk through some patches of forest that are some patches of blueberries and some of those blueberries are not, not um, burying because um, some factor of uh, uh, if the spring was was too warm or there was not enough moisture or the intensity of the sun, the blueberries did not flower. And so you need flowering to produce blueberries. So now this particular clone of, of blueberries here is, is fruiting. Now it depends on the rain, how much rain we get and just for the size of the blueberries. Um, I remember 15 years ago, we had a lot of rain during July. Now this, to this day, this day, this time now, we 
don't have the rain that we used to. Now, now, I remember when, 30, 40 years ago, when it would warm up in the spring, it would stay warm, gradually get warmer and warmer. Today we're seeing it where it would get really hot, then it would get cold, really hot, really cold. What is, how is that impacting the, the, the plants in the forest? Well, we are seeing this. This is happening. There's something, the, the, the example, the blueberries. Okay, some are, some are um, producing berries, some are not. Well, this particular little stand of blueberries here would be consi considered resilient to the climate changes. The genetics are there to continue. Some plants cannot continue because of their genetics. That could be a factor in, in continuing the, 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 the seed source. Blueberries is a seed source in the forest here. And, and well, these are very viable blueberry plants here. The, um, the, the, cl the climate with, with other plants that are more sensitive besides the blueberry here, each stand on the forest has their own set of plants. Some plants are, are producing seeds even though the, the temperature, the heat, and moisture is changing so much that some of the plants are producing seeds and continuing. So we should focus on studying these plants and why is it that, that they are continuing and other plants do not produce seeds and, and flowers. It, it, it's a it's a study to 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 we gotta look into the studies of these plants more thoroughly instead of focus on on why they don't flower. Mm -hmm. well, well, the younger younger generations and their thesis needs to investigate this for us older people. <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll see what's going on. Okay, what do we got going on here? Okay, this this particular stand here was there was a, a fire that went through in like 1972, 1973. I don't know exact date, but the, as you as you look around, you can see the trees are some of the trees are smaller, but this particular oak right here did not get burnt to where it it, it died, so it withstood the, the the ground fire here. It was not a canopy fire. Uh, a ground fire, but but some of the trees over this way are smaller, so the the fire was hot enough, hot enough to impact here. So the we're right on the edge of where the fire went through, and as you can see, we have a popple growing here, and popple is is not a it is a um, early succession tree. Mm where a catastrophe went through and then popple will take over. So this seeded in somehow. And, and as you can see, there, there is choke cherry trees. Choke cherry tree here. That, that, yeah. is, that is more of an open just like the aspen here, the, the popple tree is, the, is a catastrophe goes through. Well, it, it's a perfect example because the fire went through. And, and the, the, as we've seen in the stand before, the popple, or no, excuse me, the blueberries take just a couple years to re, redistribute themselves and can continue and start producing blueberries. But the trees take longer, 10, 15, 20 years to, to come back to, to the way the original stand, what it was like. And this particular stand here has a lot of grass. Like I said before, it's a kind of an oak savanna. Mm -hmm. And this is a good habitat for deer. As you can see, the deer bed right here. Yeah. It's nice, open, wind, not many mosquitoes, except for deer flies. And so 
so this is an important habitat for the deer also now historically there was elk here because of the bigger trees different type of um, food source for elk today the stand is changing and is more favorable to white-tailed deer but 100 years ago it was elk elk inhabited this area mm. in high numbers mm. was it um was it still like this the oak savanna for the elk or was that the only clue i have with that historically is to look at the 1920 map now this this area was more open and and, and grassland mm. oak savanna is kind of like grasslands with pockets of oak stands and pockets of white pine white pine stand and red pine stand so there was a lot of openings now due to due to back then fire was if a lightning strike happened the fire would continue until it burned itself out so there was no no human interaction with stopping fires it would continue as who knows how far so this area was continually regenerated to, to prairie land so and, and, and now this this could be due to habitation or just natural process now as you can see there's a lot of firewood on the ground here now when fire has this natural, continuous natural process, the firewood on the forest floor gets burnt. Well, there is a lot of firewood here, so, so thankful for Smoky Bear era for to control and stop fires. But mm. how much of an impact does it have on the natural process of these stands? Mm. There's still people still collect blueberries in these stands which was an impo important cultural component back 40 50 years ago like when the 1920 recession happened well mm -hmm. the food source was here so people were able to survive and continue getting groceries from the forest right so back yeah sustainable Sustainable, yeah. yeah, sustainable. Evidence of sustainability is, is right here. Welcome back. Hope you had some fun exploring parts of the Menominee Forest. And I hope you learned something about fire management as well. I want to thank Jeff Reno and Ken Mita uh, for taking on this tour of the Omni Forest and talking to you about how fire management is used. To summarize what they said out there in the field just a bit, the Menominee used fire management as a powerful and effective tool for managing the forest that they lived in. I hope you now have a better understanding of how the cultural impacts, what the cultural impacts it has. It's about that time. So you guys are good to go. Uh, remember when you get home, check people. Have a great rest of the day.